Number two, we need to read the sentence, read until we come to a period, and ask what's the subject and the predicate, what is being said. Not only do we need to study, number one, the words, number two, do we not only need to study the sentence, but number three, we need to look at the context. Number four, we need to study all that's said on that subject in the Bible. And number five, we need to gather all the historical information and place this in its proper historical setting. And to place Ezekiel in its proper historical setting, we'll analyze it quickly as follows. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On the sixth day, he created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God at first dealt with man through the heads of families called patriarchs. But in the process of time, man became exceedingly wicked, and the destruction of man was decreed by God. But there was a family, Noah, his wife, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives, who were spared. And in the book of Genesis, there's the great Genesis flood, a worldwide catastrophic event that destroyed mankind and the living things upon the earth except those that were in the ark. After Noah left the ark and after the flood, God chooses a family through which will finally come the Messiah and salvation for man. And this is in the family of Abraham. Abraham is noted as a man of great faith. His son Isaac was the child that was selected that in that line the Messiah would finally come. Isaac is noted for his great tolerance. And then there was Jacob. There was Jacob and Esau who were brothers, but it was Jacob that would receive the birthright, and through him the Messiah would come. At first he lived up to his name of hill catcher or supplanter, but he grew. His name was changed to Israel, and indeed such was characteristic of his life. He had twelve sons. The story in Genesis centers mainly on Joseph, but in the plan of God, it is Judah from whence the Messiah will come. All of this family winds up in the land of Egypt, where they are reduced to slavery. They cry out unto God, and God sends a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses, who is described as the meekest man, in all the earth. But Moses, who was privileged to speak with God face to face, that great man and that great lawgiver, Moses. As a result of the plagues upon the land of Egypt, the children of Israel were led out by Moses. They came to the Red Sea, and there by a miraculous event by the parting of the waters, the children of Israel marched through. When the Egyptians followed, they were, of course, overwhelmed. On the other side, they finally marched and continued to Mount Sinai, and there God gave the law. And the total sum of it, by the count of the Jewish rabbis, was 613 laws, Commandments, statutes, and ordinances. The tabernacle and its furniture is set up, and the people come to Kadesh Barnea, on the brink, poised to enter the promised land. But the spies are sent out, only two come back with a favorable report, Joshua and Caleb. And because of the people's rebellion and rejection of God, the older generation is not allowed to enter the promised land. Moses himself has made a tragic mistake, and he's allowed to see the land, but not to enter in. Then the leadership falls to Joshua, 
and the period of conquest begins. Joshua is now the leader. They cross the Jordan River and punch into the middle of Palestine. The strategy is to drive south and then to drive north and then to have a cleanup operation. The period of conquest is a period that required courage, bravery, persistence, and strength. After that, there is the period known as the Judges. God raises up Judges. People like Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Barak, Gideon, Tola, Jire, Jephthah, Ibsen, Elam, Abdon, Samson, down to Samuel. And in the days of Samuel, the people asked for a king. And we now began the period of the United Kingdom. Saul is selected to be the king. But he's a big disappointment in the Old Testament. At the beginning, he had everything so good and going so well, but he rebelled against God, and God rejected him. The next king is David, a man who was willing to carry out the will of God. He made some tragic mistakes in his life, but he was always willing to repent and to confess those and I ask for God's forgiveness. Next, his son Solomon becomes the king, and these reign each, 40 years each. Solomon was noted for his wisdom, but toward the end of his life, his many wives turned away his heart from God, and he built some pagan temples. Then when he passes from the scene, there is a division in the kingdom. It's divided in between the north and the south. This begins the period of the divided kingdom. The northern kingdom is now called Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. Under Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the kings. In the north, the kingdom continues until about 721 to 722 B.C., when the Assyrians take away the northern kingdom, they do not return nationally. There are those that return, but they do not come back nationally. The southern kingdom continues. During the period of the southern kingdom's existence, there's high points and low points, but it's mostly a slide downward. There are moments like those of Josiah and Hezekiah, but generally the people are sliding into ignorance, idolatry, immorality, and rejection to God. The prophets come. They appear on the scene. Amos, he preaches righteousness and justice. Hosea, he preaches love to God and repentance. Isaiah, that great majestic prophet that calls the people into account for their sins and promises the great hope of the Messiah. Jeremiah, who preached the famous sermon in the temple, the temple sermon, and told the people about their sins. But time has run out now for the southern kingdom itself. The cup of their iniquity is now full, and in the clock of God, things change. The Assyrians have lost power generally on the worldwide scene. The Neo-Babylonian Empire has arisen, and now the mightiest force militarily on the scene are the Babylonians, and in 606 B.C. is the first wave of the Babylonian army into the southern kingdom of Judah and their people taken away into captivity. And among the number taken away at this time is Daniel, who is at that time a young man, but who was morally clean and who was willing to not defile himself, but to stand for the right. This man lives throughout the entire Captivity, the entire Babylonian captivity, and turns out to be one of the great statesmen 
and one of the great religious leaders in the Old Testament. But as time goes by, the people in the south become restless again. The Babylonians come again, 597 B.C., the second wave of the Babylonian deportation. This time Ezekiel is taken away. While Daniel was taken away and placed in the court, Ezekiel was taken into a foreign land and placed out in the countryside at Tel Aviv by the river Chebar, which was most likely a large canal in the area. Ezekiel then was out among the people in the countryside to see the people, to hear the people, to preach and to teach to the people. Finally, the third wave of the Babylonian captivity will come and the final destruction of Jerusalem, 586 B.C. Ezekiel is prophesying just before the city of Jerusalem is destroyed and after. The book of Ezekiel can be divided into two major parts. The first 32 chapters deal with Ezekiel prophesying and preaching and teaching just before the destruction of the city. When the city is besieged to be destroyed, his wife died. He said, I spoke to the people in the morning and in the eve, my wife died. He was not to mourn. That was God's instructions. He followed God's instructions. Ezekiel was a prophet, a great preacher, who was acquainted with grief. Some of you have lost your wife. Some of you have lost your husband. Some of you may have lost a friend. There is something that we learn from life when death comes near. Some years ago, my wife and I had two children, twins, that were born. One lived one day, the other just a little longer. They both died. While my wife was still in the hospital, I took the arrangements to bury those children. I'd never bought a burial place before. I had land, but I didn't have a what we call a burial place. So I went to a high hill, and we bought a section, enough to bury several of our dead. And there I buried two. My dad was sick at the time, but he showed me near a tree. He said, when I die, you as my son, I want you to see that I'm buried there. And when he died... My friends, that's where we buried him. It is something when death comes near. Ezekiel said, I spake to the people in the morning, and in the eve my wife died. He proclaimed the truth of God. Finally, the last part of the book, chapter 33 to the end, deals with the hope and the blessings in the future. How do you encourage people that are in exile, their homeland, the capital, the city they love, oh, my Jerusalem, destroyed, and the temple in the visions of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel had his visions. He had his sites where he saw the theophanies, the visible manifestation of deity. But in these things that he saw, he saw the glory of God depart from the temple. And that was clear evidence. The temple was going to be destroyed. The city is going to be destroyed. The Shekinah, the glory of God, is gone. How do you offer people hope? in such a circumstance or situation. God took Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37 and showed him a valley of dry bones, exceedingly dry. He said, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, Thou knowest. 
He said, prophesy to these dry bones. That's probably a pretty good text for a lot of preachers. A lot of preachers have probably thought they preached a lot of times to dry bones. As he carried out God's instructions, bone came to bone, sinew came upon the bones, flesh upon the sinew, and then he prophesied the wind, the four winds. And breath came into these bodies, and they stood up on their feet, a mighty and a great host and army. This was interpreted to be Israel itself, God's people, God's house. Here they were. What does it mean? Well, when you read some of the writings of the dispensationalists, the favorite brand of premillennialism these days. How Lindsay in the great, late great planet Earth says in Ezekiel 37, this is getting ready for the restoration of Israel. Israel is restored to their homeland. And then there's going to be the battle of Gog and Magog. Israel will be in the Middle East and Russia with the, the allies, the Arabs, Allies and league, they'll start marching in a war against Israel, and the war will rage. But just before Russia is able to win, they will be knocked out with a flash of fire, an atomic bomb, hydrogen bombs. They'll be blown up. And then there'll be a lull in the war that has been raging, and then there'll be an oriental group, perhaps, probably, parentheses, Chinese. Some oriental group will then come, and they will start warring and fighting, and they will try to engulf the world, and the world will be in such terrible shape that everyone's killing everyone, everyone's dying off. It looks like the world is going to be killed off, but just before that happens, presto! Here comes the Lord. He's going to set up an earthly, worldly kingdom here on the earth for a thousand years in the millennium. Some of them dress that up a little bit in the Gog Magog deal. Some of them get the idea that when you read that, they have a little trouble with it. The bowl falls out of the left hand, the hairs fall out of the right hand. And from this war and from this battle, there's enough wood of the spears and the other objects that will last for fuel for months and months. And it'll take them months and months to bury the dead, so long, in fact, that he doesn't think that they'll be fighting with machine guns and pistols and rifles, that something mysterious might happen to these things. And they'll some way be out there with some kind of mysterious sticks going zip, 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 zip. Far, far fetched in the imagination of men. In the first place, the kingdom and the church is the same thing. It's already in existence, has been in existence for over 1900 years. Kingdom, Basilea, and church, ecclesia, refers to the same thing. Someone says they're different words. I know they're different words, but they refer to the same group of people, the same institution, viewed from a different standpoint. God's people viewed from its relationship to the world, it's the called out. God's people viewed from the relationship of its government, it's a kingdom, and Christ is our king. But it's still the same people. Colossians 1, 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and it translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. They were in the kingdom. You cannot be in something that does not exist. The kingdom was there. The Lord will have the Lord's Supper in the kingdom, but we'll have the Lord's Supper in the church. Therefore, when we have the Lord's Supper in the church, we have it in the kingdom. In Matthew 16, 18, and 19, Jesus said, I'll build my church. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. He didn't build one thing and give the keys to something else and never could get in, but didn't have a right key. The kingdom and the church is the same. In the book of John, the gospel of John, the word kingdom 
occurs in two chapters. John 3, it tells you how to get in the kingdom. You have to be born of water and the Spirit. That's not an earthly, material thing. That's a spiritual kingdom. How do you get in the church? Born of water and the Spirit. It's not going to be some earthly kingdom with Christ here on the earth setting up some kind of earthly, worldly government. And then in John 18, when he was on trial for his life before Pontius Pilate, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But now it's my kingdom, not from him. Anyone that has the kingdom of Christ here on the earth in a worldly, earthly kingdom, he's got the wrong one. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. It's not a worldly, earthly government or kingdom. Spiritual kingdom. It's the reign of Christ, the hearts and lives of men and women, where people have believed and obeyed the gospel and live it in their lives. In Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel was simply saying that here is the people of God in captivity. They're going to return. Don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Why, God has the power to raise up these dry bones. He has the power to restore you and to bring you back to your homeland. And he does. For God raises up Cyrus. And the world governments change from the Babylonians to the Medes and the Persians. And the Persians give the decree they can go back home. And they do. Three waves of the return. Under the Zerubbabel, under Ezra, and under Nehemiah. They return, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. Get things ready. In a few hundred years, the Messiah is coming. That is basically and fundamentally what's involved in Ezekiel 37. Behind that, the fact that these dry bones can be raised, that is evidence that a resurrection is true. If a resurrection were not valid, that would have no meaning whatsoever. And though the primary meaning in Ezekiel 37 has to do with the restoration of God's people back to their homeland, the fact that they're going to be restored back to their homeland is based on the premise that God has the power to raise the dead. And friends, one day out there in the future, God will raise the dead. Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. For this mortal must put on immortality, and this corruptible must put on incorruption. And then shall be brought to pass the saying, It is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And then when you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog. In the book of Ezekiel, Gog and Magog has been interpreted to mean many things. Some have had it, the Babylonians. Some have had it, the Greeks, especially Antiochus Epiphanes, who outraged the Jews by offering a pig there at the altar in sacrifice and gave the Jews a hard time before the coming of the Romans. But it's better, in my estimation, to have Gog and Magog as simply a name that stands for the enemies of God's people, especially the heathen nations and the heathen opposition against God's people, to try to identify them with the Scythians, with the Russians, or with any other particular tribe or group of people is extremely precarious and it's difficult to establish by any reliable authority. In the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, when the thousand years is ended, we see Satan loose again and he comes out and with him fighting against the saints, Gog and Magog. This time it's not Gog of the land of Magog. This time it's Gog and Magog who put on a par. What are they? A symbol of the opponents and the enemies against God's people, against the church. We're going to win. But heathenism, atheism, humanism, 
witchcraft, idolatry, all the enemies of the church personified under these names and under this title. These are the enemies. They are many. Atheism says there's no God. No God at all. The skeptic says if there is one, you can't know it. So you don't really know. You want to create doubt in your mind. Denominationalism says there's not one church. There's not one body. Why there are many religious groups. Just get in the one of your choice. When you look at the doctrine in connection with Christ, the infidel says that Christ is not the Son of God. Not really. When you look at cultism, they say don't follow God, don't call, follow Christ, follow some cult leader. Follow me. So men like Jim Jones can get people down in South America, 900 or so, commit suicide and or mass murder. And there are people today that want to, take in, want to take the minds of our young people and say, follow this human philosophy. Let us give you a pattern of church life, especially if you're young. None of you old folks, just if you're young. You get you a prayer partner and you report in to your prayer partner regularly. You have your quiet time, and you have your schedule where you follow it. You have daily contact with someone in our group. Daily contact, mind you. And if you cannot see one another, call one another. There must be daily contact. You give out a love bombing to people when they first come in. Love bombing. Here's some little boy or girl, no one's ever paying attention to them, they get a love bombing. Oh, how great this is. They think I've died and gone to heaven. Oh, look at all these friends. But are they really friends? Is it sincere? Is that the way you really make friends? And then they say, come over to our house. Stay with our group. The old people they don't believe in sharing Jesus. They're not really dedicated. They're not really committed. They're not really the church of Christ. They're mainstream churches. And we are the real restoring churches. you got two groups, see. And then if your mama wants you to stop doing what we tell you to do, you come live with us. But your mom and dad is a member of the church. They go to church regularly. They help all the people they can, but they're not like we are. You come live with us. To divide and alienate churches is wrong. To separate families like that is wrong. Someone says, don't you believe in putting the Lord first? Yes. But in putting the Lord first, I also know that the Lord said, honor thy father and thy mother. People that want to brainwash you. Any movement, any philosophy, any group, any organization that wants to lead you away from Christ, a part of Gog and Magog, but they'll not win. The Lord and his people will finally win and be victorious. The Lord with the breath of his might. When the Lord comes with his mighty angels in flaming fire. When the Lord comes and this world is destroyed and we are judged by him. And all the scenes of judgment have passed away. And eternity dawn. We'll then be in either heaven or hell. It's going to be one or the other. Ezekiel pointed out that a man's not born in sin. We're responsible for our own sin. In Ezekiel 18, 20, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. 
the basic fundamental premise at which Calvinism begins is total hereditary depravity, that you're born a sinner. You can't get out of that. The only change that can be made is God elects you unconditionally, but that would have already been done. Calls you irresistibly. Once you get it, you can't lose it. If you lose it, you never had it. But they start out with the premise, you're born in sin. Ezekiel refutes that, you're not born in sin. We're responsible for our own sins. And Ezekiel says, as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their evil way. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil way, for why will ye die? When the book of Ezekiel closes, some years later the captivity is over, the people come back home. The Old Testament canon is finished with Malachi. About 400 years in the intertestamental period, the coming of the bright light to prepare the way, that voice in the wilderness, John the Baptist. Then Jesus and his vicarious death in our place and in our stead. His victorious resurrection and his great ascension and the spread of the early church and the look one day that we all have for the second coming of Christ. If we would be wise, we would prepare to go to heaven. The story is told quickly about a man that was a performer, a clown, that liked to entertain people. There was a man that was a high official that saw him on occasion perform. He laughed. He laughed and carried on and said, that's the funniest man, the biggest fool I ever saw. Years went by. That high official was sick. Nigh on to death. Life had not been enjoyable at all. He wanted a little entertainment before he made his exit, which he knew couldn't be too far off. He remembered that fellow, that clown, that entertainer, and sent for him, and the guy came. And he said, I want you to entertain for me because you're the biggest fool I ever saw and ever met in my whole life. And the clown asked the man, he said, have you made preparation for eternity, seeing as sick as you are? The man said, no. The clown then said, my friend, you're the biggest fool of all, for you're getting ready to take a journey soon into the vast eternity, and you have made no preparation at all. If we, getting ready to make our move into a vast eternity, have made no preparation, we're the greatest fool of all. Don't die the death of the wicked. Come as a penitent believer and be baptized into Christ tonight while together we stand and sing.